go ahead and start that. All right, good. Um, so unlike some of these computer classes out here and other technical stuff online that can be delivered online very easily uh, in a self-paced course, um, comp lit is a little different, you know, with the nature of English and especially the discussion of literature. Uh, that's better when it's in an interactive way between the, the, the teacher and, and students and also between other students. Um, so I do prefer more of a, a face to face classroom environment um, or now that I've done this for a few months, uh, the zoom zoom does work pretty well. Uh, it's not the best avenue to conduct uh, collaboration in a classroom environment, but it's the one that we have so we'll make the best use of it. Um, so just a little bit about the course. So this is 1102 English composition to uh, and the first question I always get from a lot of my new students is, well, how is this different than 101? Uh, well, in the past couple of years, we've done a lot of things here at Northwest to kind of differentiate between the two composition classes. Uh, in 101, you are basically given instruction on how to perfect your essay writing by looking at various types of essays like argumentative, persuasive, uh, informative and expository and being able to craft those um, essays using any of one of Aristotle's rhetorical situations, logos, ethos, and um, pathos. Uh, in 102, we kind of take the next step up because um, not necessarily saying that most people are going to take this track, but for those who do want to take a more uh, liberal arts track, 102 has traditionally always been the course that kind of bridges the gap between a traditional writing class and a literature course. Uh, so the way that I teach 102, it's heavily literature based with a writing component to basically evaluate your ability to process what you have read in the literary text, being able to um, write a cohesive essay to kind of give your own perspective um, in addition to literary scholastic perspective about the nature of that text. For example, uh, why do certain characters act the way that they do? Why do some characters tend to get along with other characters, much like what you see in the real world with, uh, with, with people around you, whether it be at home or, or at school or at work? Um, a lot of times literature is a reflection of that and can kind of help you understand why human culture is the way it is and how why people do the things that they do. Uh, so long story short, uh, what we want to do in this 102 class is basically look at three different types of, of literature. Uh, first is, is fiction, you know, in the form of short stories. I'm not going to ask you to write or, or read uh, The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings uh, over the next six weeks, although I would love to teach a class on that because I'm somewhat of a, an expert at it. Um, but we are going to look at shorter based work, so it's going to be more short stories. Um, and then the second thing we're going to look at is poetry, uh, different poetical styles and why poetry is written in the way that it is, uh, namely either to um, communicate a certain emotion from the poet to the listener or the reader, uh, or in, in order to evoke some kind of image in the mind using the rhyme scheme and, and the meter of the poem itself, or the imagery that's being uh, addressed in the poem itself. And then the last thing we'll look at is, is a drama element, which uh, happens to be my favorite and traditionally what I would do in the in the drama section uh, is we would always bring in mythology because you can't find a better uh, example of drama than looking at the Greek myths and the Norse myths and uh, other cultural myths too. Um, but in the past year, we've been in this accreditation mode here at the college. So uh, what a lot of us have decided to do in the English department to make that accreditation process easier is to have a standardized curriculum. So I've kind of pushed my 
uh, core concentration to the side. And what we're going to use um, for this class is we're going to use Shakespeare's Hamlet um, as a, an example of drama. And if you've ever read Hamlet in in high school or on your own personal time, you know that there's a lot of drama, uh, a lot of human conflict that's caught up in the nature of that story. And, and we'll address some of that once we get through the class. Um, so basically, you know, for the overall scope of the class, that's, that's what we will do. We will read um, various short stories, poems, and the play Hamlet. We will analyze those stories uh, and poems and, and, and the play using a core set of what I call literary elements. Uh, I'll give you a little brief on that tonight. Uh, and then what I do at that point is turn you loose and allow you to sit back and understanding the nature of the text that you've just read, uh, analyze those stories using a combination of the elements that we use in what we call literary analysis. Um, and then you'll write a, a, a short paper on it, okay? So uh, that's gonna be the basic scope of the class for the next six weeks. Now, how do we do this in six weeks? Because uh, traditionally what I've always taught is the, um, what is it, the 16 week class where uh, we meet over the course of four months and we have some breaks here and there. Uh, I've never taught a short class uh, in this way before. So this is gonna be a learning opportunity for me. And as we get through the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna be doing a lot of analysis on my side uh, and I'm gonna need a lot of feedback from you all uh, in as far as how the course is progressing for you. Uh, because let's be honest, with this being an online course, a lot of the work that's gonna uh, take place in this class is gonna be left up in, uh, in, in your hands. Um, that's why it's going to be important over the next several weeks for you to understand that these six weeks, uh, we're compressing 16 weeks worth of content in a very short time. Uh, but at the same time, I don't want to overload you and stress you out, especially considering uh, the nature of the climate that we're in right now with the, um, what I consider still to be a health emergency. Uh, although some people don't agree with me, um, I'm still, I guess, in that kind of mindset that, yeah, we, we still need to be mindful of the social distancing and the pressures that people are under and coming out of that event. Uh, so I don't want to overload anybody that's, that's taken the class. Um, so I've got a couple of things in mind um, that I want to pass along to you. And, and again, uh, I'm just going to try it out. And if you have any feedback, if, if you have suggestions that, um, you know, that doesn't work for you, just please let me know through email and, and we'll, we'll make some accommodations there. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, I'm an adjunct professor here, as I told a couple of the students before who logged on very early. Uh, I'm a full-time guy at Eglin Air Force Base. I'm a program manager there. I work with an organization called MMHE, where we um, basically design and create prototypes for loading equipment for uh, the weapons and ammo community. So whenever you see those jets take off with the, with the bombs loaded on the stations, we're the ones that help them get those bombs out from the ammo dump and uh, loaded onto that aircraft. Um, that's my full-time job. That's what I do Monday through Friday. Most of my time is wrapped up in, uh, in that job because we've got a lot of things going on right now. Um, but as a courtesy, because I enjoy this subject so much, uh, and I have such a good working relationship with Dr. Strickland and a few other people at the college, uh, I have taken on a full course load this summer to help them out because we've had so many people um, either have summer plans or they've moved on to other jobs in response to the change in job market right now. Um, so um, I am teaching two courses for um, 1102 and then one developmental course this semester. So I'm kind of overloaded myself, uh, but we're going to make the best of it and get through it. Um, so just to give you a little background on me ac academically, I'm a 2002 graduate of Auburn University. I was a dual major there um, in, the, in the College of Business and also in the College of Liberal Arts. 
Um, dropped out my senior year because I did not want academics to ruin my social life. So I decided to give up on the English route and got my business degree. Uh, but by the time I left Auburn, I really felt like I wanted to get that English thing under my belt. Uh, I didn't want to go into the working world, number one. <laughs> uh, I tried to postpone that as much as I could. So I decided to go to grad school and um, was able to study under a wonderful Oxford uh, professor at Troy University by the name of J.F.R. Day, who specialized in medieval literature. Um, specifically British medieval literature. And under his tutelage, I was able to study comparative mythology, which was my core concentration. Um, even as a kid, I loved the ancient Greek myths, stories of the gods and the goddesses and the heroes and the monsters. Um, in, the, in the ancient Greek myths, tales, the Egyptian, Celtic, Norse, uh, even Native American uh, literature. So uh, that is my core concentration. That's what I'm good at. Uh, and I love to bring a lot of that uh, content into my 101 and 102 classes. Uh, but as I said earlier, we were in the middle of accreditation this past year. So um, unfortunately, you guys are going to be my last class where I have to adhere to that accreditation thing. So in the fall, I'm going to be bringing that content back. So you missed it just by uh, a few weeks if you were uh, if you're interested in that in, in myth, any kind of mythological tales or conceits and stuff you missed it just by a few weeks um, but anyway um, that's a little bit about me uh, I can see that I think we have about seven people uh, on here I just want to make a record of the people that did show up so I've got Damon Cooper here is that right Yes, I'm here. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Mr. Cooper. And uh, Jessica Dubose, is that right? Yes, sir. Okay, welcome. And Harley Littleton? Yes, sir, that's me. Awesome. Um, and Miss Smith, Izzy, Izzy Smith? Yes, sir. I like that first name. That's cool. Thank you. Um, War Eagle. And War Eagle. Awesome. We got another Auburn person up in here. That's great. Automatic eight. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> that would be nice. Uh, everybody would be screaming War Eagle if I did that. Um, Samantha McCombs. Yes, sir. Awesome. Well, thank you. Did I, did I miss anybody? Uh, me. Oh, who is me? Cameron Stanford. Cameron Stanford. Okay. I'm so sorry, Mr. Stanford. I, um, Hey, War Eagle it, as well. War Eagle. Awesome. Well, hell yeah, man. I'm loving this class so far. I'm disappointed um, he's not for Stanford. Say that again? Uh, I'm disappointed he's not for Stanford. <laughs> I'm sure nice. you, yeah, I'm sure you get that joke a lot, don't you? Sometimes. Yeah. All right. Did anyone else, did I overlook anyone else? Because this participants list is very short, very condensed. Okay. Like I said, uh, I am recording this for uh, other students in the class, so hopefully um, they will go back and, and watch, look at this video and kind of get up to speed. Um, so let me just, before I get started, does anybody have any questions, concerns so far about this online environment and what we're going to do so far, how we're going to work this? I wait for the mythological course. <laughs> wait for the mythology there you go um so i just want to address one question somebody somebody sent me an email today hey um is this an online course strictly or are we doing zoom are we doing a combination so here's what i want to do uh again it kind of falls in line with my philosophy i really think that a literature-based course or one that uses literature as its core um uh, base should be delivered in somewhat of a face-to-face -face manner and, and on a personal, uh, in a personal way. Uh, so Zoom is not mandated for the class, as you can probably see. Uh, excuse me, I dropped my pen. Uh, as you can probably see in the Raider net. But what I want to do as an added benefit for you all, considering the class is a six-week delivery method, is uh, I want to come on here week to week 
and offer a Zoom session so that um, I can provide a little more course instruction in addition to what I have uh, available on Blackboard and also to offer an opportunity for anyone to discuss or ask questions about the content uh, from any of the readings. Um, I, I think Thursday uh, works best. I know it works best for me, but if I get enough feedback via email from people that say, hey, you know, Tuesday works better, well, I can always do a Tuesday option as well. Um, so I think what I'm going to do from this point on is just kind of play it by ear. Um, and I'll shoot for doing a Thursday class. But again, if, if people are, um, you know, a Tuesday accommodates their schedules a little more. I don't, I, I don't even mind doing both nights um, as long as it's not a, you know, a three hour, four hour session. Um, I can, I can do a couple hours at the most. I think that will be okay. Um, and I think we'll be able to discuss enough content um, at least on one night per week to really capture everything that we want to. Um, and again, for me, uh, I think the goal that I want to, to achieve over the next six weeks is to give you enough instruction and awareness and guidance, um, not only through the YouTube playlist that I have available on Blackboard, but also through these uh, Zoom sessions to kind of give you an, an idea of where you need to go with your, with your papers. Uh, and so we'll, like I said, we'll play it by ear. If I need to come on here a little more often, I can do that. Uh, I'll work it into my schedule and, and we'll make the best of it. Um, all right. So does anybody else have anything? Let me see. Chat wise. Thursdays works for me, but I can do either day. Okay, good. Say, I love that. That's, that's, that's awesome. So uh, we'll do Thursdays for right now. But again, if, if Tuesday tends to work better for people, I, I can... I can do Tuesday or I can do both, either one. Uh, for me, um, my goal is to make you all successful or help you be successful in completing the requirements for the class and whatever I have to do to, to make that happen, I'm, I'll, I'll go forward and do it. Um, all right, so let me share my screen real quick and let's go over this Blackboard. Um, so yeah, as you can see, I've got a full course load up here. Uh, so. This class is, like I said, English 1102. Uh, the course number, that crazy five-digit number, the CRN as they call it here uh, for this class is 30089. So just make sure that this matches up uh, with what's shown on your schedule because I want to make sure that whatever grade I put here um, in Blackboard is the one that's going to translate over to your student account. Uh, and if those numbers don't match up, it won't it won't carry over. So just do me a favor and kind of check through your uh, Raider net and just to make sure um, that 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 course record resource number is is cor listed correctly in there. Again, that is three zero zero eight nine. OK, so we're going to have a little discussion here about Blackboard. Um, I'm sure everybody has seen this uh, content management system before. Um, I'm sure you all have pulled your hair out in the past with it. Um, I know I have. It's not the most user-friendly option out there. It's not the quickest. It's not the fastest. Uh, a lot of times I feel like I'm working on a Windows 95 desktop uh, when I'm working inside this system, especially when I'm grading a lot of papers, but um, that's the best we got to work with right now. Um, so as you can see here, just kind of perusing through, I'm not going to go over a lot of these things at, at length um, because, you know, it's, it's pretty much the same thing you have every year or every semester ad nauseum. Uh, I will address a couple of things here in the syllabus. Um, so again, this, this, it says on here that it's an online course. Uh, and initially, when I got the requisition for it, um, it said that it was a Tuesday, Thursday class that met from five o'clock to 8, 10 p.m. Now, RaiderNet is not showing any time at all, period. Uh, so that tells me that the class is switched or converted over to a, a traditional online format. 
Um, but having said that, again, I am going to offer the Zoom option um, as, as a supplement because I want to make sure that no one is flying blind, uh, is not aware of what the course objectives are, what they have to do, what they have to read, what they have to write, when is it due, whatnot. So uh, we're going to make sure that we cover that um, with a Zoom class or a Zoom video or, you know, any, any there's numerous ways I can do this, but right now, uh, Zoom tends to work out best right now. Um, final exam, there is no final exam per se. Um, I just had this put up here because the final paper was due August 10th. I've decided to change that, which is one of the things that I'll talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, there will be no final paper per se. Uh, will not be a final exam. Again, this is a six, seven week course. Um, and to throw a final comprehensive paper on top of you, I think is a little unfair. Uh, it's certainly not only unfair to you, but it's unfair to me too. Um, so I'm kind of looking out for myself here as well. Um, so I, I, I've got an, an alternate solution that I want to throw out there to the class and and I think you're, it's one that you're going to like. And again, we'll get to that in a few minutes. Um, so if you have any other questions about uh, what the learning objectives are, um, you know, what the course description is, how many credit hours that you're going to get from completing this class, all of this information is uh, located in the syllabus. I'll allow you to read it at your own leisure. Um, again, this is one of the, the sections at the beginning of the class that everybody tends to, you know, their eyes start glassing over because so uh, I'm not going to go to it through it at too much in length. One of the things I do want to bring to your attention is this uh, course material here. Um, this is required for the class and um, I'm actually teaching the longer version right now and some people have opted not to buy the textbook. Um, because a lot of these stories are available online for free. Uh, and I, I am aware of that. And I'm cool with that. Just be aware, uh, if you decide to go that route and save a little bit of money, you may not get the same addition from the website or from a downloadable PB, PDF that we may be covering in, in the class. Uh, so your version of the text may vary. In what ways it varies, I, there's no way I can tell. Um, and, and I can't really guarantee that the content is authentic, that, you, that you're downloading. I, I kind of gave that caveat to one of my daytime students, and they were like, well, I'm just willing to, to take the risks. I'm like, okay, go forth and conquer. Do what you got to do. Uh, I do advise students to buy this book or to rent it or borrow it from someone. Um, whatever, whatever way you, in which you do, that's totally up to you. Um, it is Kelly J. Wells is the editor for the book. It's the Norton intro to, myth, uh, I was about to say mythology, uh, literature, the portable 13th edition. Here's the ISBN number. And a lot of people don't realize that if you take and copy that number right into Google, a lot of times it'll take you to Amazon or take you to the bookstore. It'll help you find the cheapest version of that book. All you got to do is copy and paste that number right into Google. Um, and if you have uh, some kind of extension in Chrome or Edge uh, that allows you to find coupons, you may be able to find it at a cheaper price. Again, I don't know, um, but I've heard from other students that that's <laughs> they've been able to find great deals doing that. So uh, totally up to you. OK. Uh, one of the things that I will need you to do is if you're going to plan on purchasing this book, you need to get it ASAP uh, because, again, this is a six week class. So this class is going to move very fast. It's going to move extremely fast. Um, and again, you know, we only have six weeks. So that comes with the territory. Um, so there's going to be a lot of reading to do in a very short amount of time and, and the papers that have to be written. Um, you're going to want to you know, take good notes and, and stay on top of it as much as you can to make sure you don't fall behind because uh, the paper requirements are going to be coming around and you're going to just, it's, you're going to feel like you're in a hamster's wheel. Uh, so the best advice I can give you is to uh, log into the Blackboard. Uh, if you're able to uh, connect your email 
client on your phone or your tablet or whatnot to to Blackboard. Um, I've heard that there's ways to integrate the the calendar um, from Blackboard into your Outlook, so you always know what papers are due when and where. So that can help you do a little bit of time management and planning. Um, whatever option works for you, go for it. Uh, I'm more of a traditional paper guy. Um, I usually write stuff down a couple of times over so I don't forget anything. Um, but anyway, so um, the other thing here is that's <laughs> that is uh, really not applicable to this class is, is, is attendance. Um, there is going to be no required attendance for uh, tonight's Zoom class or any other Zoom class. Again, this is a traditional online class. Um, what you get out of the class is totally up to you. How often you engage is totally up to you. Uh, your grade, your final grade will not be dependent upon participation in a Zoom class or logging on or any of that. Um, uh, I, I assume that everybody who signed up for this class understands how quickly it, it, it will progress. Uh, is organized enough to keep up with it and um, you're you're ready to go so you know you, you may be of the mindset of hey I just I'm ready to get this done and get it over with and, and move on um, so you know totally up to you whatever you get out of it I'm not going to um, try to even track people down to see you know who's engaging with the zoom videos or not um, so that enough about the attendance thing. A lot of these other things are pretty much standard uh, verbiage that you'll see in a course syllabus. So if you have any questions about any of the uh, items here um, or sections in the syllabus, uh, please reach out to me um, via email. So this will kind of segue into uh, professor, how can I best get in contact with you? Um, I've had students in the past who relied on text, and as my wife can tell you, I'm the world's worst texter. Why? Because I don't, I, I don't respond to them. Uh, I don't read them half the time because usually I'm focused on getting stuff done, uh, and those things tend to, to annoy me. Uh, the little notifications, the bells, and all that stuff, it just pisses me off. So um, unless it's a medical emergency, I usually don't respond to a text. Um, now, having said that, does that mean I'm incommunicado a lot? No, uh, I'm always readily available. Um, right now, I'm in a teleworking posture, but they are trying to bring us back on base uh, ASAP. Considering the nature of my job, I am in meetings literally from eight o'clock in the morning all the way through four or five o'clock in the afternoon. Um, if I'm not in a meeting, I'm missing one. Uh, or I'm in a meeting that's about another meeting, and it's a whirlwind, um, but it's, it's, it's pretty much the nature of what I do. So um, I advise students who need to get in contact with me, get questions answered, get guidance from me to email me, and the reason why is because I'm communicating with you right now on a laptop, and as you, well, you probably can't see because I got it blurred, but there's another laptop sitting beside me. Uh, this MacBook that I have over here, this is my school um, laptop. This is what I use to, to do everything with, uh, with the college. Uh, so if you email me, I've got my email program opened up over here uh, that's always being monitored. So if you email me, I get it within a few seconds. Uh, usually this side over here is what I'm working on uh, for Eglin, or if I'm doing something else and I'm doing all these more, or I'm sitting in a Teams meeting over here. Uh, so I leave this MacBook open so that I can um, stay in contact with you via email if you have any questions, concerns, or uh, need some feedback on a paper idea, or you need me to look something over, whatnot. So again, my email address is Davis c65 at nwfsc.edu. That is by far the best way to get in contact with me, period. Um, you are welcome to call me uh, if you have an emergency or something or, you know, you just need to schedule something. But just be mindful that a lot of times I'm at a telecon, so this 
this phone is also uh, tied up in a meeting. So uh, again, that, that email is gonna be the best way you can get in contact with me, okay? So um, enough about the syllabus. Uh, again, you know, if you have any other questions about it, please email me and we will uh, uh, address your, your question and uh, get it answered. Okay, uh, any questions so far about the syllabus? I don't think so. Okay, all right, good deal. Uh, so let me bring your attention to this next item here, which is gonna be the course schedule. Um, again, this is, a, this is a rough outline. And again, it's also extremely ambitious, but again, you know, this is a six week course. So we're gonna do the best we can with the time that we've been allotted. Um, as you can see, what I've got, um, schedule for this week is kind of a course introduction and to kind of give you a brief overview of what literary analysis is all about and the different elements that are uh, used uh, whenever you're analyzing a piece of fiction or poetry or uh, uh, in this case um, a play. Um, and so starting week two is when you're really going to hit the ground running, okay? So uh, for those who tend to be more proactive, if you want to go ahead and get started, I encourage you to do so. Um, but by, you know, July 5th, this is the time that you're really going to want to ramp up and start moving along and getting the content um, read and start working on the assignments that, that we're going to complete here. Again, as I mentioned a while ago, we're going to cover three different genres of literature. Uh, fiction in the form of short stories. We're going to look at a, a short story by the um, Nathaniel Hawthorne uh, titled "The Birthmark." Um, a second, the second short story is one by Toni Morrison, who is a wonderful, wonderful uh, American writer um, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, she wrote a piece called "Rest to Teeth," which uh, is really applicable to the climate in which we're living right now. And it basically calls your attention to um, race relations and being able to um, communicate with people on a personal and a human level, uh, despite coming from a different cultural background and, and a different ethnic background. Uh, and we'll analyze that one as well. But beautiful, beautiful piece. It's a wonderful piece and uh, probably my favorite out of the three. Um, then we'll look at Ray Bradbury. I know a lot of people love Ray Bradbury, especially if you're a science fiction person. Uh, you've probably read Fahrenheit 451. Uh, we're going to look at a short story uh, titled The Velt, which uh, is extremely applicable today uh, because writing it so many decades ago, he kind of sat back and being a futurist, wondered what life would be like if human, the family unit um, had a lot of technology in the home, what, you know, and, and, and had this comfortable lifestyle with, with technology pretty much doing everything for them in the house and kind of raises an eyebrow because uh, if you live in a house like I do, which we have a, uh, a lot of automated things here, you know, when I arrive home, the garage door opens or I can sit there and tell Siri or Google Assistant, hey, open my front door. Uh, so a lot of these things that Ray Bradbury kind of envisioned uh, in this futuristic sense many decades ago are kind of here today. Uh, so it kind of makes you, you step back and go, wow, that's not so futuristic after all. Uh, all three of these short stories really at its core um, really analyze human relationships, okay? being able to communicate with another person, being able to step outside of your box and look at the world from a totally different perspective, um, uh, which is something we can all learn from even, even today. Um, so that core set of short stories, I think, is, uh, is perfect for this class. Uh, they're not very lengthy, okay? So uh, for those of you who are, who are kind of stressing about, you know, reading a lot in a six week period, uh, the selections that I have here and that we we've, we've had standardized for the past year or so, they're not very lengthy. Um, 
with the exception of Hamlet, is a little more um, more involved and there's a lot more content to it, but that's why I, I put in a couple of weeks there. Uh, the next section we'll look at is poetry, uh, which happens to be most students' least favorite, which I understand uh, totally. I get it. Um, but as you will see, especially through the lectures that I provide online through YouTube, um, you have to think with a different part of your brain when you're sitting down and, and reading a poem. Um, if you try to analyze it in a logical way that you do uh, fiction by using the scientific method, who, what, when, where, and how, uh, you're going to be lost. Okay. So as I tell my day students, if fiction from a literary sense is tapping into the left side of the brain, which happens to be more logical and analytical, uh, relies on the power of observations to make, um, um, you know, theories and stuff about what it's observing and, and analyzing and processing those, those observations. Poetry taps into the right side of the brain, which means you need to be, you need to throw those things out the window and really tap into a creative, emotional uh, side that kind of allows you to use those same powers of observations, but in a totally different way. So of course it changes your perspective. Then drama with Hamlet, um, you're basically gonna take a combination of the two, okay? Uh, plays have characters, they have a plot, they have theme, but they also tap into more abstract concepts like emotion and imagery and metaphors, uh, things that may not be so in your face and obvious. You may have to read between the line a little bit. So that's why um, uh, drama is the perfect ending because it allows you to use the core set that you just learned using different parts of the brain to analyze different styles of literature and then putting all, the whole thing together in a whole brain approach and trying to, you know, tap into that. Okay. Um, and so like, like I have laid out here, we'll cover fiction in one week, uh, poetry in, in the third week, and then weeks four and five, um, we will cover Hamlet. Ignore the last thing there where it says final paper due. Again, I have changed my mind uh, on how I want to conduct this. So that final week there will be the week that I allow you all to wrap up any things that you are, have fallen behind on or have missed along the way. So that, that's gonna be a week um, that allow, again, you're not gonna be asked to analyze anything new, write anything new, but it's gonna be a catch up week. Um, and believe me, you're not gonna be the only ones who need the catch up week. I'm gonna need it too, all right? So that's basically going to be the, the course outline, what we're going to do. All right. So let me, I know some people are going to have uh, some questions about what is this responses I see up here? What are these discussions? Uh, I'm going to come back to Blackboard and, and we're going to uh, talk about that real quick. Um, so here's, here's a couple of other things that I really want you to look at, really zero in on. Um, and, and, and kind of, this is gonna lay the foundation. So uh, the syllabus class, uh, quiz, this is an extra little free points that I throw in there just to make sure that everybody is participating in the class. If we have an attendance confirmation exercise that's required, which I think we do, this will satisfy that. So um, what I encourage you to do for those of you who are listening now, and for those of you who watch this video later on, get this syllabus quiz completed ASAP. Um, it, no later than the fourth, please, because um, I need to make sure that if we do have an attendance confirmation that's required uh, for the class, I gotta have at least one exercise that's completed or you may be removed uh, from the class. I am gonna make a note here of everybody who attended tonight. You're, you're, you're not gonna suffer that consequence even if you miss the quiz, uh, because you you have actively participated. Um, so, but at, having said that, please go ahead and at least complete the syllabus quiz. It's only three questions. It's very, very easy. Uh, and then this intro to the course in literary analysis, we will talk about that here in a few minutes. Um, so let me talk to you a little bit about how the class is structured here. 
Uh, one of the things that I like to do in addition to, um, of course, assigning the regular reading assignments and then writing papers on top of that, I like to throw out little things that are outside the scope to kind of um, um, gain a little perspective in, into my students and kind of keep up with uh, how well they are engaged with the class and how, how much they're learning from the class. So I've, I've created these little things called reading responses. Um, and for this class, you're only going to have three uh, that are available in, in this class. So um, basically the scope is this. I give you something to think about, something to analyze. Maybe it's a news article or maybe it's a lecture that I gave um, and I'm asking a question based on uh, the reading of the article or the, the content or analyzing the lecture that I gave. How would you how would this change your way, your way of thinking, or how would you use this skill set in a future job opportunity one day? And so basically the reading response is a one page essay, a very informal personal essay answering that question. Okay. Um, it is like, like it says, it is a response to a reading. Uh, so one page is all that's necessary. Uh, you get some points out of it, and again, it allows me to uh, kind of gauge how well people are processing what we're trying to do here and how well they're uh, performing at meeting those objectives and stuff. Reading response number one is going to be in, res in response to one of the things that we're going to talk about tonight, which I will end the video with uh, an explanation of, and I use this in all of my classes. Uh, You've probably heard of it before. It's uh, Plato's uh, Allegory of the Cave. Um, I start all of my classes, whether they're the 101, 102, mythology classes, we always start with that because I think it's a wonderful way of setting the stage for why it's important to step back and look at things from different perspectives. Um, reading response number one is centered around that. Uh, basically a one-page response to, have you ever been in a situation where you thought one thing was true? Maybe um, whether it's in a personal relationship or in a job or whatnot, and you thought one thing was true, and then later on you learned the actual opposite was true or it was different in some way. How did you react to that? Um, so uh, I get a lot of different responses. Some of them are very heartfelt. Uh, um, and very deeply personal. Um, and it's, like I said, I end up learning a lot from my students from, from asking that kind of question. It's really cool. It's probably one of my favorite exercises. Um, reading response number two is uh, a response to a video. It's a TED Talk. Um, and it's basically about um, this guy who is, is, is in business and he developed a love of literature, specifically in character development and character analysis and how he used the, the, the elements that he learned in the literature classes and applied them to, to the business world. In other words, um, I'm sure all of you have seen the show, The Office, you know, that the wonderful TV show on there with Michael Scott and Dwight Schrute and all them. One of the interesting things about that show is it mimics real life. It mimics reality. You're going to come across characters who are like a Dwight Schrute, who are know-it-alls. They, they think they're above everyone else. Uh, they're always out to sabotage other people to make themselves look good. How do you deal with characters like that? Not only in a story, but in the real world. How do you deal with that? Uh, and this video, this TED Talk, is basically one guy's perspective on how he learned to analyze character and character traits and apply dealing with those different archetypes in the business world. It's absolutely fascinating. Um, and it's one that, considering the fact that I'm in the business world, Alan Eglin, and I deal with so many different personality types, um, it, it, it's absolutely a skill set that is, is useful. It really is being able to understand uh, how different types of characters or people think 
why they do the things that they do, what are some of the archetypes that are associated with them, can kind of give you a heads up on dealing with those people up front uh, and being able to work with them or manipulate them to getting what you want, uh, which in the business world is absolutely the case, right? It's a game. So um, it kind of gives you the keys to the game a little bit. He, and again, I, wanna, I want you to kind of write a little response. Having learned what you did from him in that uh, video, how do you think you would respond or use those techniques in a future job opportunity? And again, it, there's no right or wrong answer there. Um, again, it's just a response. So um, just another little hoop that you have to jump through. Reading response number three. Uh, is basically a response to module number two, which is poetry. I want you to try your hand at writing a poem. Love it. Uh, actually, I had one guy who turned in one of the most humorous poems, um, and I thought it turned out, it started out very serious, and it ended up being one of the most hilarious things I've ever read in my life. Um, and that was last semester, and I can't. Honestly, I can't even remember offhand what it was. <laughs> I kind of feel bad about it because it, it was hilarious. But, um, you know, just, just try your hand at it. Just write a one-page poem. Uh, I get this question all the time. Well, can I write a whole page, a page of haikus or limericks? No. I want to block. I want to kind of see what your thought processes are. What are the different range of emotions that you're trying to um project in this block of, of poetry, uh, but it doesn't have to rhyme, okay? It can be free freehand or not freehand, uh, free writing, free verse. Um, so you don't have to come up with a rhyme scheme. I'm just looking for a, a, a brief attempt at, at trying to write one. Those are the three reading responses. They're short exercises. They're all one page in length. Not a lot to do there, okay? Um, again, there's just extra points that are associated with it. And that's reading responses. Um, module number one. Again, uh, everything that you need to know to complete each one of those weeks that you saw in the course schedule is located right here uh, in this module. Uh, there's going to be three of them that you have to complete. Um, I do ask that you complete them in order. So start with the fiction first and work your way through. Uh, once you complete that one, then you can go on to poetry and then go on to uh, drama afterwards. But basically uh, the scope is this. Required readings for that module are located right here, okay? So Mr. Professor Davis, what am I supposed to do for module number one? What am I working with here? Well, you're gonna find it in the required reading section. So right here, ignore the dates. Again, I'm pulling this from a previous uh, class. Ignore the dates, just follow the, the course schedule that I showed you all ago. But from the text, I do a lot of the hard work for you. You're gonna like this. I do most of the hard work for you. The textbook that I'm wanting you to use, uh, Kelly J. Mays, the, the Norton Introduction to Literature, Three different stories that I mentioned a while ago. I even tell you what page number they're located on. You don't even have to look it up in the textbook, okay? Um, so basically for that first week, starting next week, July 5th, go ahead and read these three stories, okay? Which is Hawthorne's The Birthmark, Morrison's Rest of Teeth, and Bradbury's The Belt, okay? Go ahead and read them. Again, they're not very long. Uh, you can knock all three of them out in one day. While you're reading the text, what I encourage you to do, especially in this online environment, take notes about what you're reading and specifically use some of the elements that I'm going to talk about here in the next few minutes. Take notes about those specific elements that you're deriving from those works. Take, take good notes. OK, so note taking, good note taking is extremely important in this class, being able to pull the information that really jumps out from the page and kind of smacks you in the face, things that stick out in, in your mind. If it happens, you want to write that down, okay? Because that's probably going to be information that you want to talk about in your paper, okay? So fiction one is going to center around those three uh, required readings. Here's a, 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 a brief that I'm going, or a, sorry, I'm talking Eglin speak now. Here's a PowerPoint, a lecture that I'm going to um, uh, talk about here in a few minutes. 
And as you can see, I have discussion board posts, okay? So basically, here's what I want you to do in discussion board posts. And this is gonna take care of the participation aspect of the class, the attendance or whatever you wanna call it. Every work that you read, I want you to go on here into the discussion board. So let's say, for example, you just completed um, the birthmark by Nathaniel Hawthorne. You've read it, you've taken good notes on it. You're going to sit back and you're going to analyze that work. And there's going to be things that you think about and questions you want to answer and, and observations that you've made about that work. Those observations are unique to you, but they are worthy to be heard. How are they going to be heard in this online environment? Through this discussion board post. Okay. So what I want you to do is I want you to click into the discussion board post after you finish that required reading. I even throw some sample questions up here for you. Now, you don't have to necessarily go this route, uh, but this, these questions tend to help those who are having a difficult time trying to come up with something to say. Uh, so, for example, here, in what ways do you find the characters and events in this story realistic or unrealistic? Okay. If you do not find them particularly realistic, what effect does that viewpoint have on how you read the story? Um, in other words, if they're so fantastical, they seem beyond the realm of, 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 of realism or possibility. Uh, how does that change your viewpoint of the story? Is it too fantastical? Is it too off the wall? Uh, does it matter in, in what way the characters and events are unrealistic or realistic? Again, these are sample questions. You can come up with your own. Uh, you've got your own perspective, your own observations. What I want you to do is to share the, those observations with your fellow students. And here's why. And this kind of goes back to the cave perspective, uh, the cave allegory. Um, everybody reads something from a text different, even though what the author intends is one thing which we call allegory, uh, which is in their authority to make that decision. We all find things that are applicable to from a story or about a story that are based on our own observations, our own experiences, our own perspectives, okay? Those are, even though we don't have the authority to say that that's what that story represents, that doesn't mean that our perspective is irrelevant, okay? So what I want you to do is I want you to share your perspective, share your thoughts, share your ideas uh, and experiences that kind of relate to, to that work and share those with your fellow classmates, because here's why that's important. You may see the story in one way. Somebody else comes behind you, another student, and they say, well, you know what? I noticed something about this character in this story, uh, the birthmark, Georgiana. Um, you know, maybe one of the reasons why she submitted and, and didn't stand up for herself is this or that. And you may not have picked up on that. That's information you can use in your paper. So the more ideas that you all share with one another in these discussion boards, the more content that you're gonna have available at your fingertips to write your papers, okay? There's gonna be three of them. I'm gonna give you a preview. There's three papers that you have to complete, no more than three to four pages each. I'm gonna make it that easy, okay? The reason why is because this is only a six week class and I don't have time to really go into the true historical context uh, that I want to and, and, and to have the pace of the course that I want. So we're gonna do an abbreviated version here. Three papers for each of these modules, three to four pages a piece, that's it. That's all you need to do. These discussion boards are gonna help you generate ideas, thoughts, topics, observations, not only from your own perspective, but from everyone else in the class to have enough information there to write that paper, three to four pages a piece. We're going to rinse and repeat that process for poetry and for drama, okay? So above all else, let me, let me encourage you, highly recommend you do and complete these discussion board posts. Above all else, OK, because these discussion boards are going to generate more ideas and more benefit to you than anything else. 
Okay. It's not important. Yeah, it's important to read the work. It's important to take notes, but these discussion boards are going to kind of fill in the gaps that you need to take your paper in the direction you want it to go. Okay. All right. So any questions so far? Do you like what you hear, especially when it comes to paper length? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions, actually. Uh, one would be, do you know if the bookstore will be open tomorrow since it's the 4th of July weekend? Uh, I do think the bookstore will, is open tomorrow. Uh, somebody asked me that today and I checked and the bookstore was open today. So, um, yeah, I do believe it's open. Uh, the best thing you can do is just call them in the morning before, you know, if you have a long way to go before you drive all the way over there, just give them a call. Uh, you can get that number from the website. All right. And my okay. other question, was, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. What was your other question? Uh, my other question would be, uh, will we be viewing uh, everyone's papers on the Zoom meetings or no? No, no, I can't share everybody's papers on here, um, but <coughs> you're still going to get benefit because the discussion board posts, when you post something out there and you throw a lot of ideas and a lot of observations out there, everybody in the class is going to be able to see that. And you're going to be able to kind of share a pool of data and information and observations. So that part will be shared, but your actual papers uh, will not be visible to anyone else. All right, thank you. Okay, so the one thing that you're missing here uh, and the reason why there, it's missing is there's no drop box for the fiction paper. Uh, that's because I basically came up with this idea this afternoon and I haven't put it on here yet. So you will see a couple more emails populate into your inbox, letting you know that there's drop boxes available for a fiction paper, a poetry paper, and a drama paper. Don't freak out. Everything's going to be fine. Now, the due dates... The due dates for those papers will be a real realistic timeline. Here's what I want people to understand. If you miss the due date, unlike my traditional class, I'm not going to penalize you for it. Okay. In these six week classes, it's important to be on time. It's important to have time management skills here, uh, but I'm not going to be the, the, I usually use a coarse word here, but I'm, I'm going to be nice tonight. I'm not going to be a butthole and start docking you points, uh, a letter grade for every day it's late. I'm not going to do that. Uh, th this class is going to be stressful enough. The abbreviated timeline schedule is going to be enough. But um, what I do encourage you to do is get these papers in on time, because the sooner you do, the better uh, perspective you have on your performance you're going to have. Okay, so the quicker you get them in, the quicker you get your grade, the more comfortable you're going to feel about how you're performing in the class. Okay, so it's it really is a benefit for you to get them done on time, uh, but there's not going to be a penalty if you don't. Now, if we get to the last day of, of, of the class, which I'm going to call it in here, August 8th, that's going to be the date that your drama paper is due, August 8th, because I need two days to grade everything to get your final grade in there. Uh, if you don't turn in your assignments by August 8th, yeah, you're not going to get credit for those. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to draw a line in the sand somewhere. Okay. So August 8th is going to be the absolute last day that you can turn in missed assignments and, and late work. Okay. So let me go over this one more time because I kind of got side, uh, got off the beaten path here. Module one, which you're going to start next week, three assigned readings. As you can see, I've got discussion board posts for all three readings. Okay. Talk about them, discuss them with your classmates, throw ideas out there, respond, respond to what other people are saying. Okay. That's going to generate even more ideas. All right. So at a minimum, that's what you have to do. You have to complete these discussion board posts. You do that, you're going to get credit. You're going to get some points. Um, and then the last thing that you're going to have to do once you complete those required readings and discussion board posts, write your paper, select a topic. Okay, here's, here's an idea for a topic. All three of these stories feature characters who have 
an inability or a resistance to empathize with other people. Maybe they're narcissists. Maybe they're, they have some other kind of psychological disorder that prevents them from really tapping into how their actions, how their words are affecting other people. Okay. What does that say about the characters in the story and how that translates to the real world? Okay. Um, that's literary analysis. That's character analysis. That's giving perspective of why you think, for example, uh, Elmer in the birthmark, who happens to be a science scientist who is obsessed with having nature perfect, is willing to destroy the thing he claims he loves most by perfecting it, which happens to be his dearly beloved wife, Georgiana. Why is that? What causes people to become so narcissistic or um, sociopathic? that they would destroy the very thing that they loved or the very relationship they claim to love in order to achieve something that's unattainable, okay? Um, that's one idea. Again, I actually had a student last uh, semester who is a psychology major who absolutely took my idea and ran with it and absolutely knocked it out of the park. I mean, he nailed it. Uh, he psychoanalyzed every character um, in these three short stories, and he came up with, with an idea of, well, according to this professor or this uh, scientist, uh, this character is suffering from this psychological disorder, and here's some of the reasons why, okay? And all of that was related to the characters that he was analyzing in his literary analysis. I mean, it was absolutely spot on. It was perfect. It was almost a graduate level paper. It was, it was rock solid. I'm not saying you have to do that, okay? I'm not saying you have to do that at all. Um, but that's just one of the things that, one of the, uh, the ideas, one of the things that you can do. Um, so basically the structure of the papers are like this. What did you observe? about the characters or the plot or the theme? What are your observations? And then you go out and do some outside research with articles or uh, journal articles or news articles or books or whatnot that kind of bring in evidence to kind of back up your viewpoint. The, the traditional academic essay is what we're trying to do here. Uh, let me see here in the chat. I wanna make sure that I address questions in the chat. Will you be giving specific topics for papers or will we pretty much pick a topic related to the stories that interest us? Um, traditionally, that's what I do. I'm not one of those professors that I'm going to tell you what to write. Um, and you'll see the reason why, because I, I believe in the platonic theory that everybody has a different perspective and what's important to me may not be important to you. And that's cool. I like that. I like that we're all different. I like that we all have different uh, thoughts and opinions and uh, our own individual perspectives. So uh, I'm not here to brainwash you, to think like I do, to see the world like I do. In fact, the way that I see it may not be perfect. In fact, I can go ahead and tell you it is not perfect. I learn from my students just as my students learn from me. So what I will do for you all, since you're in a six week, I will throw some selected topics out there to help you generate some ideas, but you're not required to use any of them. Um, I want you to feel calm and, and confident enough to come up with your own observations. Say, you know what? I see this common link between this character in the birthmark, this character in rest to teeth, and this character in the belt. Uh, there's a common link here between all three. Let me write about that. Dude, that's exactly what I'm looking for. That's your own unique perspective. The only thing I ask you to do is do some outside research. And what you'll see uh, when you see the Dropbox populate tomorrow, uh, I'll put a re requirements document in there, letting you know everything that I want in the paper as far as the formal composition is concerned. I'm just looking for a couple of two or three academic sources that back up what you're thinking, okay? Most of the perspective that I'm interested in in this class is your own observation. I'm just asking you to go out and do just a little bit of outside research using the library database or Google. Um, 
to find a credible source that can that can provide evidence to back up what your what your observation and your your thinking is. Okay. Again, we'll talk a little more about that here in a few minutes as well. Um, so that's basically the the flow of module one. Read the work, generate ideas through your note taking, participate in discussion board posts to refine and generate more ideas for your paper. Uh, come up with a central topic and just start writing the paper and turn it in. I'm not one of those where I want to see an outline. I want to see your introduction. I want to see what your body paragraphs look like. I want to see what your conclusion. I'm old school. The only thing that I want to see at the end of that module is your final paper that's turned in. Um, and as students will tell you, I'm more interested in the content that you're presenting and less on the format. So I'm, I'm one of those weirdos that uh, I don't get anal about the comma being out of place or you know, I use a word out of context. If I understand what you're trying to say, to me, that's all that matters. Hey, I'm from Alabama. My accent's not the best in the world. My, language, my grammar's not the best in the world, even though I hold a master's degree. Um, it happens. Okay, and I'm not one of those that's anal about little mistakes that's being thrown out there. So um, I'm more interested in what you have to say, not so much in how you say it. Um, so again, we'll 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 cross that bridge when you get there. Um, so that's the flow. That's the basic flow. Uh, poet uh, module number two will cover poetry. There's quite a few poems in there, but remember poems are very, very short, okay? Very short. Um, and basically um, in the required readings list, you'll see all the different poems that I want you to read. Again, do not worry about the dates that are shown up here. Just make sure you've read um, the poems. We've got William Shakespeare, uh, three different poems. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day, my mistress's eyes, and let me not to the marriage of true minds. All three of those poems have a central theme, which is love, but they're all written during three different points of his life. Okay, one is a young man, one is a middle-aged man who's married, and the last one is, is an old man looking back on his life, more spiritual at that point. Um, but they all have that common theme, okay? Same thing with uh, the next group of poems. Langston Hughes, The uh, Ballad of a Landlord, John Keats' Ode to a Nightingale, Coleridge's Metrical Feet, and Alfred Lord Tennyson's The Charge of the Light Brigade. Now, you're going to notice that on page 528 of your textbook, they gave you one stanza out of that poem. Why they did that, I don't know. That makes no sense to me. So what I did is I went and found an academic version of that poem and I placed it here in the module Dropbox for you, The Charge of the Light Brigade. Download that and read it when you get to the poetry section, okay? And then the last group are metaphysical poems that deal with um, different types of spirituality and existentialism and, and et cetera. Um, Seamus Haney's The pu uh, Punishment, Shelley's Ode to the West Wind, Herbert's um, Easter Wings and Dylan Thomas, do not go gentle into that good night. This happens to be one of my favorite poems that most of my students have. They love this poem. Um, those are the, the, how many of them are there? Um, four, eight, 11 different poems there for you to read. But again, they're, they're very short. They're not lengthy at all. Um, so ju just like, the fiction paper, just, excuse me, my wife just came home and I want to make sure my five-year-old didn't walk out the front door by himself. Um, just like the fiction paper, I want you to read these poems, discuss, you know, take good notes about the poems, things that you jump out on the page and, or from the page into your mind, uh, discuss the poems at length in the discussion boards. And as you're going to see when I put the Dropbox in here, what is the, the poetry paper going to look like? Well, again, it's a three to four page poem, uh, not three to four page poem, three to four page paper. 
two parts. One is biographical. So I want you to select one poet to write about out of this group. One poet that you really enjoyed reading, you, you want it, you're interested in. The first part of that paper is going to be a biographical section. So tell me who that poet was. What country did they live in? What was the culture like? What were some of the major events that were going on? Um, what were some of the cultural uh, issues and religious issues that were going on at the time? The reason why that's important because all those things have an influence on a poet's writing. So the biography section is important. The second part is I want you to pick one of the poems and analyze it. Tell me about the rhyme scheme. Tell me about the meter. Tell me about some of the symbolism that you see in that poem, the imagery that's being used. Um, um, the tone of the poem itself, is it a happy poem, sad poem? Why is that? You know, what is the, what emotion is the poet trying to convey through that poem? Um, and that's basically it for the poem, uh, the poetry paper is it's a two part paper, one biography, the other analytical on one of the poems. Okay. And then for module number three, again, module number three is a little more lengthy because it is a play. Um, so we're going to, we're going to tackle the play in a different way. Um, and here's the reason why. Plays were never meant to be read. They were meant to be heard uh, in the theater. People traditionally for hundreds of years said, uh, I went to hear the play Hamlet the other night and it was absolutely wonderful. They didn't say I went to see a play. They said I heard a play. Um, and that's because a play is based around discourse and conversation. The characters are having a conversation with each other and you're actively participating in that play as almost a character, a non-participating character yourself. So you're hearing what's going on. And through what you hear, you kind of get an idea for who these characters are. What are they trying to accomplish? What is the plot of this story? What, are, what is the starting point? What's the end point? Uh, what is the overall theme of this play? What are some of the symbolism uh, imagery that's being evoked in here. Again, we're, we're bringing all this together. Now, to help you, this is something that's unique to me. None of the other professors do this, but I do this because, again, I'm old school. I'm traditional. This is the way it should, been, should be taught. I've got a couple of links on here to uh, a couple of different performances, uh, uh, productions of Hamlet. One is a more contemporary version of Hamlet that is that was performed uh, in the Globe Theater in London. Um, it's a little more progressive, a little more modern and contemporary. Um, and it's a wonderful play. So what you what you can do is as you're reading the play, you can stop at, at a certain act and then watch the YouTube link and follow along with what, what is going on. And I have found in this way, students get a lot more out of the play when they actually can see the characters on the stage, listen to the characters instead of just trying to decipher what they're trying to say from the text. Again, plays traditionally were never meant to be read. They were meant to be heard. So that's one of the options that you have. The other one is from Bob Jones University. It's a little more traditional. You're gonna see if you choose that version, they have the more classic uh, over the top uh, costumes, you know, that kind of show the importance of that character if they happen to be a royal monarch or a prince or whatnot. A um, little over the top, but, you know, no less in, uh, effective. Uh, so you have those those options there, or you can you can go on YouTube and um, find your own adaptation, or even th there's a movie by uh, Kenneth Branagh, who is a wonderful Shakespearean actor. He actually made a more modern version uh, of Hamlet that was based around World World War One, um, and a lot of people use that as 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 a, a, a method of study there too. Again, it's totally up to you totally up to you what how you want to 
uh, interact with Hamlet if you just want to read it and follow along with the uh, YouTube discussions that I have up here. You can do that, or you can actually utilize the links that I provide there uh, on Blackboard to the actual plays, okay? And again, the same method is applicable in drama as it is in fiction and in poetry. You read the play, listen to the play using the YouTube links. You're going to discuss each of, of, of the different groups of acts that I have here. You've got a discussion board for acts one and two, acts three and four, and then act five. So basically, I throw some questions out there. Why does Hamlet treat Ophelia in such a cold way when, you know, he's, she's supposed to be the object of his affection. He's a prince. She's a beautiful young lady. He wants to woo and, and marry her. Why does he treat her so coldly on this quest for revenge? Um, why does Hamlet in certain, like, a, a, act three, why does he hesitate to carry out his revenge uh, against his uncle? Uh, when he has the perfect opportunity to, to, to do that? Why does he hesitate? Again, those are observations that you're going to have, um, different scenes that happen in the play. And again, when those things happen, I want you to jot down your observations, your thoughts, you know, about it, trying to answer those questions. Um, and again, the, the discussion boards probably uh, are more useful in drama than they are with poetry and fiction combined. Uh, that's what I've seen over the past couple of years is um, when it comes to drama, man, there's no, no shortage of opinions out there on why people like to cause drama and create drama and act the way they do, man, th these discussion boards go, go nuts at that point. So um, again, utilize these discussion boards uh, to the fullest extent. The more content you put out there, the more content that your fellow students put out there, the more ideas that you can generate to uh, write your paper. And again, the final um, paper that you have to write for this class will be in response to Hamlet and Hamlet only. Uh, I'm going to pull the, the final paper requirements in from the other class. But again, I'm only looking for a three to four page paper. I'm not looking for a thesis. I'm not looking for a dissertation. Um, you're basically going to analyze the play Hamlet from one of four perspectives. Uh, one of the topics is death. You know, all of the, the, the symbolism of death and decay that are present in Hamlet. Why did Shakespeare focus on that so much? Um, Hamlet himself has a, a, an extreme inability to relate to and communicate with females. The two important female cast members in this play, his mother Gertrude and his love interest Ophelia. Why does he have such an inability to communicate with them? Um, what prevents that from happening? You know, is, is it this quest for revenge or is he just not relate to women very well at all, um, that, that could be an exploration that, that you can write about. And then, of course, we've got a couple other topics in there as well. Once we get to the drama section, I'll, I'll cover those uh, paper requirements a little more at length. Like next week when, we, when I give an, a lecture on uh, fiction and I cover all the different stories in this Zoom format, I'll go ahead and, and throw out the, um, or throw up the, um, uh, fiction paper requirements, and we'll go over them at the end of the class, so you got an idea of what you need to write about, okay? Um, I've thrown a lot at you right now, um, so I'm going to pause here so I can get some water uh, and quench my thirst. Uh, by the way, you'll probably, you don't see this on your view, but you're looking at it right down here. It says final comprehensive paper. I hid that. Why? Because we're not going to do that. I'm not going to do a final comprehensive paper. We're going to have three short papers and that'll be it. Okay, so I'm going to delete this. Actually, I'm going to delete it right now. And that way it doesn't show up and nobody stresses out. Boom, it's gone. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to pause. Um, pause for your questions. Anybody have any questions so far? 
None here. Awesome. Okay. So here's how we're going to conduct this over the next several weeks. Uh, again, I'm going to come on here on Zoom on a weekly basis or Tuesday night, Thursday night, if people want it. Uh, and I'm going to provide a short lecture about the different sections uh, that we're going to cover for that week. Again, the second week starting next week is going to be fiction. I'll do a lecture on that, a short lecture. The week after that, I'll do one for poetry, covering all the readings and all the uh, topics that I want to talk about. And then the final two weeks, we'll break Hamlet down um, in two different parts and cover um, those over the last two weeks. Okay. Now, if you're not able to participate in Zoom, you've got a couple of options. Okay. Uh, again, I am extremely sympathetic to people's different schedules. Uh, some people have full-time jobs. Some people have families at home right now. Uh, kids are running around screaming like you probably heard my five-year-old do just now. Um, so I'm trying to make this class as easy to access and uh, personable and, and available to you as possible. So in addition to the Zoom classes, I'm going to record each one and throw them up on here uh, on Blackboard. I'll, I'll post a link to them, either upload them to YouTube or just if they're short enough, I can throw them up here on Blackboard. The other thing that you have available to you, and if you look up here on the course content all the way to the end, I actually have a ENC 1102 lecture series. This is a YouTube playlist that I created last year when we first, uh, everybody first started locking down and, and living in your own bubble. Um, and I was teaching 1102 last year and we immediately had to go into um, bubble mode. Stay at home, do not come to the campus. Uh, so I created a series of lectures to provide course instruction and guidance and topic, um, uh, discuss topics uh, for all of these different sections in the class. You are avail You have free access to those. You can watch them at your leisure. Um, you can watch any of them that you want in the whole playlist or just pieces and parts, whatever you want to do. Uh, all you have to do is click the link here. It goes straight to my YouTube channel, which is uh, very boring. I had every intentions of becoming a gamer streamer or whatnot, and I'm just too old to do that crap. Um, but what I've done is, uh, like I said, last year in response to COVID, um, I had to create a series of lectures in order to engage with my students. Um, and at the time before we, we moved into this house here at Blue Water, I was living with my in-laws. And so a lot of the <laughs> a lot of these videos were recorded outside um, and the audio is, is, is pretty decent, but uh, for anybody who lives down here in Niceville and Blue Water, you know that the Eglin jets fly all the time. So you may hear a jet in the background. You may hear a helicopter. You may hear a UPS driver riding by. Um, but again, in, in some of my students who have used this, they kind of chuckle. They're like, what in the world? I'm not a YouTuber, man. I'm not a video content creator. I have no idea what I'm doing. Um, but I just started recording uh, most of these videos on my phone or my laptop and just started rambling away and lecturing. Uh, so you do have this option, okay? They cover everything from meeting me, intro to the course, literary analysis and, and the birthmark, all the way through Hamlet, all the way down here. And, and it, I even got the Hamlet videos up on the blackboard. I'm going to bring them over here too. Uh, but you do have that playlist at your at your um, availability. Okay, so it, it's available to you. You're like I said, you can watch it at your leisure. Do whatever you need to do, uh, especially for those who have um, uh, 
dynamic situations with your job or your family and you know you got vacation going and on and you're not going to be available to come online with zoom um that that's going to be able to work work out for you there um and in certain places even in the modules you'll see that there's videos um i did these last semester uh specifically for hamlet uh, I do an intro in the playlist on Hamlet, but I actually put the um, the links up here in Blackboard. I'll make sure those get populated into that playlist as something. See, that's why my YouTube channel sucks. It's absolute garbage, man. But um, I'm going to clean it up for this class. Um, so anyway, you've got multiple ways of uh, engaging with the class. You've got Blackboard, you've got the YouTube playlist, and then you've got these little videos that uh, are populated in the modules. And then you're also going to have Zoom. Um, so between all four of those avenues, you should have more than enough um, guidance and instruction through those four ways. So. Um, but if you do encounter some problems along the way, please let me know. We will uh, we'll accommodate you and, and, and help you out any way I can. Um, and we'll just, we'll, we'll tackle each individual problem as we, as we cross that bridge. All right. So here's the last thing that I want to do. I wanna just kind of give you a brief, cor brief course intro. Again, um, oh, that's, that's the YouTube. We don't wanna watch that. You can watch that on your own. I don't want to play that. That's <laughs> so I want to bring up the um, PowerPoint here. It actually starts off in, in fiction module number one. It's called literary analysis. Uh, I'm actually going to move this up here to the course content because it's applicable to all the modules, not just the first one. Um, you click literary analysis, you're going to get a little PowerPoint that, should, that pops up. Um, well, hmm. did it block it? Tell you what, I'm just download the original file. Oh, there it is. It did download it. I'm sorry. I'm an idiot. I am an idiot. Okay. Not very good with these computers sometimes. Um, so yeah, here's the PowerPoint that I put together for you all for, for uh, literary analysis. This is what you're gonna use for fiction. Uh, I'll just do a brief overview in it uh, tonight just to keep the Zoom sessions short. Um, and, um, but you can get a lot more information from this by just downloading the PowerPoint yourself or, um, watching the intro video on YouTube. Basically, in literary analysis, we have different elements that we're going to use to analyze a particular literary text, whether it be fiction, uh, poetry, or drama. Uh, in the case of fiction and drama, um, we do have specific literary uh, elements that we tend to focus on more than anything else. And those happen to be character, plot, and theme. Okay, uh, Character is by far the, the cornerstone of, of literary, uh, of, of, of literature. Uh, most of the literary texts that we have involve narratives that discuss um, different characters and their, and the, um, the journey that they're on or the uh, situation that they're in. Um, and you have different types of characters, of course, that show up in, in different narratives. Uh, but in its base form, we, we basically represent a character as a, as a person, a place, or a thing. Yeah, a place can be uh, considered somewhat of a character, may not be an active character, but in the case of uh, Professor Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Middle Earth itself, um, some, some literary scholars actually do classify Middle Earth itself as almost being like a character um, because of the unique nature of the world in which uh, that story has taken place. Uh, but really at the root, a character is a representation of the person, place, or thing that performs some kind of traditional human activity or function uh, in the work of fiction. And like I said, these characters come in different flavors. 
Um, the two main ones that I really want you to focus on are the protagonist and the antagonist. Now, traditionally, um, we refer to these characters as being the hero or the villain of the story, right? Um, and the, the only issue that I have with that now, again, I am a traditionalist, old school, but uh, considering the fact that we have a lot of stories that are coming out now, especially on the Disney side and uh, through Netflix, where we're exploring the lives and the background of uh, traditional villain type characters. Um, a lot of times when we tell a story from their point of view, they become the protagonist. Because again, a protagonist is defined as a character around which the story revolves. Not necessarily being a hero or a villain, but it's the character around which that whole story revolves, the main character. Uh, and a villain can be a ca main character in a tale. And the antagonist, you know, as we traditionally say, is, is being a, a, an evil type character or a villain. Uh, the antagonist is, is the character that, or the force that works against the protagonist, trying to stop whatever they're trying to do. Now, let me give you an example of why that, that confusion uh, can be alleviated with, with these terms. Um, you probably remember the movie from the 80s, uh, The Karate Kid, right? Anybody not seen The Karate Kid? Um, that was a story about a young guy who moved to a new area, moved from, I think, New Jersey to California. Uh, he was being bullied picked on uh, and this old man kind of took him under his wing and taught him karate and he was able to overcome uh, that situation and triumph in the end by getting revenge on the bully and you know um, getting back at him well now thanks to Netflix we have um, a whole new show a whole new series a whole new story revolving around the villain of that story right uh and it's called cobra kai and it follows the character of johnny lawrence who was the villain the bad guy from the karate kid all those years ago uh, and so as they've developed that story you kind of relate more because of the way the story in which it's written you relate more to the villain right? You kind of understand who he is more, why he acts the way he does. Why, why was he a bully so many years ago? Well, you kind of see that in the story. Now he becomes the protagonist because the kid, the story is revolving around him and you, the, the viewer, you're kind of relating to him now. And so in an ironic situation, now the hero is being reintroduced in that show and being shown as working against him. So he becomes what once was the protagonist now becomes the antagonist. Um, I guess another, you know, like I mentioned Disney a while ago, um, Disney has started this whole new line of stories based around the villains uh, like Maleficent and uh, Cruella de Vil and, and some of those evil characters from, from those uh, fairy tale movies. Um, so that's why we, we kind of shy away from the, the hero versus villain kind of arc. Uh, now we look at it from a protagonist versus antagonist because a protagonist can be a hero or a villain. It really depends on who the author wants to make the main character of the story. Okay, so those, uh, like I said, that we have other different character types here, and and like I said, I want you to read through this and kind of get to know uh, what the different character types are. But mainly, the two main uh, characters that you're really going to want to focus on in in reading fiction and and in drama, who are the protagonists? Who are the antagonists? Who are the characters that the story is revolving around, and and who are the characters that are working against them? Okay. Um, and then plot, again, the plot is basically the, a, a sequence of events, right? If you have a bunch of characters who are sitting around like the old man that from my old hometown, they just sat around on a, a, a bench in the, in the local mall and they just watch people go by. That's not a very interesting story. Why? Because they're not doing anything. They're just sitting there. Um, what makes a story interesting is having a plot. You got to have a starting point. You got to have an end point, and you really need to have a lot of interesting things that go on the way uh, to kind of keep you engaged in the story 
to want to get to that end result. So uh, as I tell my other students, it's a lot like planning a trip to go somewhere. Let's say you want to go to Disney World and you put the starting point in Google Maps and you put your end destination in Google Maps and Disney and it basically tells you how to get there, right? Well, along the way, you can take little deviations here and there, uh, little side adventures. and But the journey that it takes to getting from, from the starting point all the way to Disney, that is basically the plot. That's your roadmap, right? That's what a plot is in, in a story. It's basically being able to understand what is the starting point, the end point, and all the intricate little details uh, that happen along the way. And of course, some of those details are defined here as uh, conflict. Of course, if you don't have some kind of conflict between the protagonist and the antagonist, wh why, why even worry about the story, right? Uh, it's, it's not even really a story. Uh, people love conflict. They may not enjoy being personally involved in conflict, but we love good stories where a conflict is going on because we want to root on, we want to root for the protagonist and we want to see them defeat uh, the antagonist and accomplish their goal, whatever it is. Um, and that conflict, the rising action involved and the crisis point and the falling action afterwards, uh, that kind of defines how that story is, is carried out. And the last thing that I wanted to discuss here was a uh, theme. OK, again, character, plot, the setting that's involved with it, the location in which that story is taking place are all important. Uh, and then the last major element that you're going to use starting next week, uh, analyzing fiction is going to be theme. OK, and theme is, is one of those abstract things that really causes a lot of people anxiety and when they're sitting down and they're trying to figure out what in the hell am I reading here and why am I reading this? You know, but uh, basically, in a nutshell, a theme is some overarching identifier uh, to kind of give you an idea of what that story is about, right? So I put that even threw it in here in the PowerPoint. Some common themes that we're all used to is that conflict that happens between good and evil, the hero versus the villain, right? That's a theme. Um, you see that if you're a fan of the Avengers or whatnot, you, you see that the, the heroes in that story uh, are trying to save the planet and keep the evil guy from destroying it and everything else. I mean, that that's good versus evil. That's a theme. Um, some other themes out there kind of center around, you know, the aspect of human nature itself, uh, religious topics, social structures, class warfare, uh, human rights, feminism, racism, war, education, sex, friendship, love, compassion, all of those things. All of those things can be themes of a book to kind of give you an idea what that story is about. Here's the, here's the issue that a lot of people run into. What the author intends for the book or the story may not be what the reader derives from the story. How do we reconcile those two? How do we give allowances for those two? Because both viewpoints are important, okay? As I mentioned a while ago. Um, and so we kind of look at these themes in, in two different modes or, or two different ways. One being what we call allegory, which is basically a narrative form which the characters or plot are representative of some overarching human trait, okay? Or an event. And it's intended to be allegorical. So this thing in the story represents this thing in reality. It's totally intended by the author. It's dictated by the author. It's demanded by the author. Okay, that's what we call allegory. In contrast to that, we also have a, a, a thing that we call applicability. And for some reason, that slide got deleted. I'll talk about that here in a few minutes. But basically, applicability is what you derive from the work. In other words, what do I find about this work, the themes that are involved that apply to me? You know, what experiences have I had in my life that kind of forced me to kind of think about that in order in, in response to this work? Did something happen this work in this piece of fiction that 
is very similar to what's happened in my life? Or does a certain character see the world in a way that I see the world? Again, that's called applicability. And that wasn't intended by the author. Okay. The author didn't write it that way in order to make it allegorical for you. But that does not negate the fact that it is personal to you. So that's why we come up with these two different terms. Allegory applies to the author and applicability applies to the reader. And I think Professor Tolkien summed this up perfectly when he gave an interview to um, someone when they were talking about the whole, uh, sir, it, 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 it's ironic that the Lord of the Rings is, was written off the hill, the hills of World War II. Is your work intended to reflect and, and represent the struggles that took place in World War II. And he didn't deny that there were similarities there, but that was not what he intended whatsoever. And so in order to explain why his viewpoint on the work was completely different from, from readers, he came up with this wonderful saying, and, and, I, and I love it. I use it all the time. And this, is, this sums up the difference between allegory and, and uh, applicability perfectly. He says, I cordially dislike allegory in all of its manifestations and have always done so since I grew old and wary enough to detect its presence. And what he means by that is people placing thoughts and opinions that they have and projecting it onto him. In other words, saying, well, he wrote this to be allegorical for this reason. He hated that, right? Because his intention from the work was completely different than what the reader perceived it to be. As he, as he goes on, he says, I much prefer history, true or feigned, with its varied applicability to the thought and experience of the readers. And I think many people confuse applicability with allegory, that one resides in the freedom of the reader, applicability, and the other in the purposed domination of the author. In other words, allegory only can, can only be defined by the author, whether it's in your face and, and active or whether it's in subtext and very passive, okay? But that is, is in the authority of the author, the domination of the author. Only the author can decide what work or what aspects of a literary work are allegorical. In other words, if something happens in that, in that story, or if there's a certain character uh, that represents, you know, kind of similar to someone in reality, only the author has the right to come out and say, yes, that is a one-to-one -one relationship. But he didn't discount the readers. He said, no, what, what a reader derives from the work is applicable to themselves, but it's unique and it's individual, and therefore it cannot be ruled as, as allegorical for the work itself, okay? So I know I've thrown a lot at you on, on an opening night, but just to kind of give you a preview of where I want you to go, starting next week with Hawthorne's The Birthmark, uh, Morrison's Restative, and um, Bradbury's The Belt. I want you to read those works, and as you're taking notes, I wanted you to take notes about the characters, the plot, and the theme, okay? Take good notes, your observations on who are the characters, why do they do what they do? Are they a protagonist or are they an antagonist? Does that define their actions? Why do they act in a certain way? Why do they speak in a certain way? Why are they able to get along with other people? Why are they not able to get along with other people? Throw down as much information as you can on a page while you're reading the work in response, trying to document character, plot, and theme, okay? And like I said a while ago, whatever you write down in your brainstorming session through your note taking, that's going to translate um, over into the discussion board posts. And with everybody in the class participating in those discussion board posts, you're going to have a lot of thoughts and ideas in order to craft the three to four page paper that I want you to write. Okay. Um, so again, I want you to download this uh, literary analysis text and uh, just peruse through it, but specifically 
uh, character plot and theme, I really want you to do, uh, do everything you can to make sure that you understand uh, why those elements are important, why they're applicable to fiction. And once you get that down, then you can start taking good notes and, and really focusing on it. Uh, the last thing that I want to bring your attention to is in response to reading response number one. And I had the, let's see if I can find it again real quick. There we go. I'll bring up an image here. And again, I always start off all my classes uh, with this little, this little lecture, okay? So everybody knows who Plato was. I'm pretty sure he was an ancient Greek philosopher who uh, loved to hear himself talk. Uh, he provided a lot of discourse, a lot of uh, opportunities to share thoughts and opinions and knowledge with his students. Uh, he had a very famous student by the name of Aristotle, uh, who we credit as being the cornerstone of and defining the cornerstone of Western civilization when it comes to poetics and rhetoric and law, specifically, uh, and even religion and theology. Um, very applicable because he had another famous student. Uh, Aristotle had a famous student by the name of Alexander the Great, who took all of the lessons that Plato passed down uh, to Aristotle and who in turn passed it on to him and used that to formulate the great Greek empire known as the Macedonian empire, uh, Alexander's great empire. And, and, and the reason why that's important is because um, Alexander till this day is that military might and that philosophic mind uh, that is studied in, in some of the military academies around the world, uh, specifically here in the United States. Uh, even at West Point, they still study the campaigns and exploits of uh, Alexander the Great as a general and even his thought processes uh, as, a, as a military philosopher. Um, but it all started with Plato. And Plato, um, again, I want to use him as a foundation for this class because regardless if you're reading fiction, poetry, or drama, I want you to understand the importance of your perspective, okay? Your perspective and your observations are important in an applicable way to being able to analyze a work and formulate thoughts and ideas to, to generate and put into a paper. Uh, and here's the reason why, because according to Plato, all of life is like we're here in this cave, okay? All of us here in these mortal bodies, these trapped on this planet, it's almost like this cave, this planet is a cave. And as you can see right here, um, there are people that are living in this cave and they're, they're chained to the wall here, okay? And that represents being in this mortal body and being um, forced to use the five senses to reason our whole existence that's going on around us, reason why people uh, do the things that they do and why culture acts and, and is, is composed the way that it is. Um, and according to Plato, when he was trying to use this story to, to illustrate uh, his philosophy on human culture and human existence, he said that these, these prisoners were thrown in this cave and they didn't, real, they didn't understand the reason why. They just knew that they were here. They existed and they've always existed there. They were chained to the wall, okay? And the only thing they were allowed to see in this dark, dank cave was these images that were cast upon the wall. So you can see these images right here on the wall. And each image is different. And each image is representative of every person that's chained to the wall. Everybody sees something different. And this image that's cast upon the wall is reflected from a light source over here that's coming in from the outside world and, and, and coming in, okay? Uh, and according to Plato, everybody who was chained to this wall saw these images on the wall and they thought that they saw something different, okay? And they argued and they debated and they never could agree about what the actual nature of that object was on that wall. And one prisoner was allowed to leave the cave one day to go out into reality and see the world um, for what it was. And 
in a short time later, that that prisoner came back and wanted and demanded to be chained to the wall again because what he saw in reality was far scarier. It was was foreign to him. He wanted to go back into the comfort zone of his own perspective. Why is this important? Why why even use this? Because that's the whole purpose of education. That's the whole purpose of enlightenment, to understand that the way that you see the world is like the reflections on the wall of that cave. You see something different than everyone else around you. It doesn't make you right, and it doesn't necessarily make them wrong, but the pursuit of coming together and understanding that there is a reality that exists outside of our own perspective, our percept, our perspectives, being able to identify what that true reality is can eliminate a lot of the confusion, a lot of the ills that plague human culture and can tear down walls that keep us separated. And that's one of the beautiful things about literature is that you are allowed to sit down and discuss a story that revolves around characters and individual characters, people with their own thoughts and their own feelings and their own ideas and perspectives. Wow, why do they do the things that they do? Why do they act this, the way that they, why, why are they able to get along with some people and why are some people they're not able to get along with? Um, gives you a lot of perspective about human culture and why we are the way that we are. And, and I think the most important thing that he was trying to get at was that in order to solve a lot of the problems that plague human civilization, it's important to break away from the comfort zone of your own perspective, take a deep breath and kind of see the world from a different perspective. Be open enough to see the world as another person sees it and learn from that. And when you're able to do that, you realize that a lot of the shadows that are cast on the walls of your own perspective are just that. They're just shadows. They're not real. They're manifestations of your own insecurities or your own thought patterns or your own um, emotions, right? Uh, and they lock you in and they um, cloud the world that is around you. And that's one of the things that we try to um, show here in this course is that that's an applicable skill being able to see the world in a different way and seeing it from other people's perspectives literature can help you do that specifically in the form of fiction poetry and and plays and that's what we're going to do we're going to use this as a cornerstone and a foundation to carry out the next six weeks um using that perspective and being able to share perspectives with other people we're able to fully understand the composition of the work, its intent, and the author that wrote it. Okay, um, and so there you go. There's there's a brief introduction. Well, not really brief. I've actually gone two hours. I actually went two hours, and I didn't mean to to use the whole time. Um, but there you go. There's there's a course introduction for the class. Um, so I've, I've kind of gone over what we're going to do for the next six weeks kind of giving you uh, an introduction to the course itself, uh, some of the literary and now uh, elements that we're going to use over the next week. So again, for next week, um, I want you to kind of get a general understanding for what character, plot, and theme are. Go ahead and read the fiction works. And by next Thursday, I'll come on here and I will, I'll do a better job. Next week, I'll keep it in one hour. Um, what we're going to do next Thursday night is briefly go over those literary now uh, elements again, and then we're going to talk about and I'll lecture about uh, the birthmark with Nathaniel Hawthorne, the uh, recitative by Toni Morrison, and also uh, Ray Bradbury in the Veil, and uh, that that will be the basic flow from the course from from this point on. Uh, I'll use. Uh, the Zoom videos and online events as an opportunity to kind of give you a brief about, or not a brief, a lecture 
uh, about what the, the, the required work readings are, their context, and the author's historical perspective for those works, okay? All right, um, I'm about to sign off for the night. Do I have any questions before I let you go? No? So. None okay. from me. Say that again? I said none from me. Okay. Uh, does everybody feel like they have a good handle on what we're doing, what we're going to do? Okay. Um, I think so. Okay. All right. So, um, well, having said that, I'll sign off for the night. And again, I apologize for going a little longer than I intended. Um, but, you know, I, I just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same page uh, because it is a six week course. So I wanted to make sure that I covered as much uh, of the course content as I could as far as the method of instruction and all of the objectives that, that we want to accomplish for the next six weeks. Uh, between now and next Thursday, if you guys have any uh, questions or concerns or confusion, please reach out to me via email. And also uh, just know that tomorrow I'm going to create three drop boxes, one for fiction, one for poetry, and one for drama. And uh, you will see the requirements document in those drop boxes uh, fully defining what I'm expecting for that paper. The page link, uh, I don't care about word count. I know I always get that question every semester, but word count drives me crazy because it stresses students out, uh, especially during the writing process, because all they're focused on is meeting the word count, not really thinking about what they're writing. So the way I want to do this and the way I will do it is I give you a general guideline for page length, and then I turn you loose. You use as many words as you need to to write that essay. No more, no less, period, okay? Again, I worry more about what you're saying than how you're saying it. Uh, so again, I'll put those drop boxes in there tomorrow. I'll give you a requirements document that outlines the page link, um, the general format for the paper, uh, questions and topics that I want you, you know, you could write about or you can come up with your own topic. Um, and then just some other general information for the scope of the paper. Okay, we'll do that for fiction poetry and for drama okay all right if nobody else has anything i wish you all a good night um thank you for showing up again i know it was last minute i hope you all have a wonderful fourth of july weekend or as uh, uh sometimes i like to poke fun and say happy treason day <laughs> i always throw that out there and it, it ruffles some feathers and that's the only reason why i say that because it ruffles some feathers but yeah have a wonderful, happy fourth weekend. Enjoy the weekend. Be safe. And I will see you all next Thursday night at five o'clock. All righty. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Have a good night and see you all next week. See you then. All right. Let's see. Stop.